Hi, welcome to Nuclear Chemistry. My name is Dr. English. Today we're going to be talking about half-life and radioactivity. Specifically, we're going to look at radioactive decay, the basics, what is half-life, understanding how to use table N, mapping half-life, the graphical analysis of half-life data, and finally some half-life practice problems at the end. So based on what we've talked about before, we know that a radioactive substance generally has a pretty large difference in the ratio of protons to neutrons. And naturally, radioactive elements typically have 83 or more protons. And remember, 83 is the atomic number for bismuth. So that's where on the periodic table we really start to think about the elements being naturally radioactive. The rate of decay of radioactive particles occurs at a constant rate. Radioactive decay occurs randomly. Decay is independent of factors such as temperature, pressure, and concentration, which we also know as molarity. So what is half-life? Half-life is the time it takes for half of the atoms in a given sample to decay. Each isotope has its own half-life, and we're going to be looking at a sample of those from table N. So one example is iodine-131, and iodine-131 has a half-life of 8.021 days. The shorter the half-life, the less stable the nucleus of the atom. Half-life can range from billions of years to fractions of a second, as we can see from these examples down here. Uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.47 billion years, while polonium-214 has a half-life of 1.5 times 10 to the negative 14 seconds. That's a little bit of a difference. Here is table N, and table N gives us a lot of information. We have the nuclide. So the nuclide is basically the symbol and the atomic mass of the isotope that we're looking at. It provides the half-life, which we see in days, years, milliseconds, minutes, different units of time. And then it gives us a very important piece of information, which is the decay mode. And knowing how to use the decay mode is really important. So if one of these nuclides undergoes radioactive decay, the decay mode tells us what type of particle is going to be released, whether it is a beta particle, a positron, or an alpha particle. And finally, it gives us the nuclide name. So basically matching the symbol to the name with the atomic mass again. So let's talk about how you would map half-life. Here's an original sample of 100 grams of a radioactive element. I'm telling you that this radioactive element has a half-life of two years. We can basically map out visually the decay of the radioactive substance. So we're going to start with 100 grams. And through this process of decay, we're going to be taking the mass and cutting it in half. So we go from 100 grams to 50 grams to 25 grams to 12.5 grams to 6.25 grams. And every time we cut that mass in half, that is a half-life. So if I had to count the number of half-lives here, I would say, well, this arrow represents one half-life, and then we have our second half-life, our third half-life, and our fourth half-life. So the total half-lives used here is four. And the total amount of time that passes is basically the half-life, which they tell us is two years. So two years times the total amount of half-lives because each one of these arrows represents two years. So we had four half-lives that went by. So two times four gives us eight. So the total amount of time that has passed is eight years. Eight years. And the total amount of substance remaining, as we can see in this last box here, is 6.25 grams. Let's look at another example, the half-life of carbon-14. How much of a one gram sample of carbon-14 will remain after three half-lives? According to table N, carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,715 years. So we're going to start with one gram. One half-life goes by, so that's 0.5 grams. Another half-life goes by, so that's 2.5 grams left over. And finally, here's our third half-life right here, which means we're down to 0.125 grams. So again, each one of these arrows represents half-life. So the total half-lives used here 
three. The total amount of time, well that's taking the number of half-lives that have gone by, which is three, and multiplying it times 5,715 years, which will give us a grand total of 17,145 years. The total amount of substance remaining, 0.125 grams. Now let's talk about the graphical analysis of half-life data. This graph represents the decay curve of a radioactive isotope. What is the half-life of the isotope? Well, at time zero, we know that we have 140 grams. So basically what we're going to do is take that 140 and divide it in half, which means we're going to go to right here, which is 70 grams. And then we're going to match up this spot right here. So I can go down and say, well, that's 15 years. But let's check it one more time. That's just one sample. If we take the 70 and we cut it in half again, that leads us to 35, which is roughly right about here. And then if I go across, it intersects this line right here, and hey, that's 30. So the difference from here to here is 15. From 15 to 30 is another 15. And that basically tells us that the half-life of this particular isotope is 15 years. And we could keep on going and seeing the same general trend all the way through this graph. Okay, let's do a couple of half-life practice problems. Let's look at the first one together. A radioactive isotope has a half-life of 2.5 years. What fraction of the original mass remains unchanged after 10 years? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to take the total time, so we're just gonna call that TT, the total time and divide that by the half-life. So we're gonna say HL for half-life. So the total time here is 10 years. And we're going to divide that by the half-life, which in the problem states that that is 2.5 years. And if we do 10 divided by 2.5, we're going to find that that is four. Once we have that, we know that we can find the fraction remaining. And to find the fraction remaining, that is one half to the n power, and that n represents the number of half-lives. So if I do one half to the fourth power, that is going to be 1 16th remaining of my original sample. Let's look at the next problem. What fraction of a strontium-90 sample remains unchanged after 87.3 years? The first thing that we need to do here is to go to table N and look up the half-life. So we go to table N because they're not going to state that in the problem that you need to refer to table N. So we're going to go to table N and find out that the half-life for strontium-90 is 29.1 years. 29.1 years is the half-life of strontium-90. And just like above, we're going to take the total time and divide it by the half-life. So the total time here is 87.3 years and we're going to divide that by 29.1 years, which is the half-life, and we're going to find that that is three half-lives, three half-lives. So again, because we're looking for the fraction remaining here, we're going to say one half to the nth power, and that three is going to be our n, so one half to the third power, which means the fraction of the sample remaining unchanged is going to be one eighth. And that is how you figure out the fraction of a sample remaining. Let's look at another problem. Compared to the half-life and decay mode of the nuclide strontium-90, the nuclide RA226 has a longer half-life in the same decay mode, a longer half-life in a different decay mode, a shorter half-life in the same decay mode, or a shorter half-life in a different decay mode. So obviously to do this problem, we need to go to table N. And the first thing that we need to look up is the half-lives. So we're going to have strontium-90 and we're going to look at radium RA-226. So when we compare these two and we look at table N, we find that the half-life of strontium-90 is 29.1 years, while the half-life of radium is 1,599 years. A little bit of a difference there. The other thing that we need to look at is the decay mode. Strontium-90 will undergo beta decay, so B negative, while radium-226 will undergo alpha decay. 
So by looking at this information and looking at our choices, we see that RA is going to have a longer half-life because that's 1,599 years, and it's going to have a different decay mode than that of strontium. So that means that our answer to this problem is going to be number two, a longer half-life and a different decay mode. And you're gonna depend heavily on table N to figure out this problem. Let's look at the next problem. Determine the total time required for an 80 gram sample of iodine-131 until only 1.25 grams of the sample remains unchanged. Okay, what I'd like you to do is stop, see if you can do this problem on your own, and then check your work. Welcome back, let's see how you did. So our initial mass is 80 grams. And what we're trying to do is figure out how many half-lives have gone by until we reach 1.25 grams. So what we're going to do here is keep dividing by two until we get to 1.25. So 80 will go to 40, 40 will go to 20, 20 will go to 10, 10 will go to five, five will go to 2.5, and finally, 2.5 will go to 1.25 grams. So now what we need to do here is look at the number of half-lives that have gone by. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six half-lives that have gone by as I've gone from 80 grams to 1.25. Iodine-131 has a half-life of 8.021 days. So to figure out the total time that it takes to go from 80 grams to 1.25 grams, what I'm going to do here is take the half-life of 8.021 days and multiply it by the number of half-lives that have gone by, which is six. So six. So 8.021 days times six is 48.1 days. And that is to the correct number of significant figures because if I look at my first number, that's 80.0, that's three significant figures there. I look at my second number, 1.25, that's three significant figures. I do not look at the 131 because that is a constant. So I know that my final answer here of 48.1 days is to the correct number of significant figures. And that is something that we always need to keep in mind. Okay, here is another graph showing the decay of a radioactive substance. Again, I'd like you to pause the video, see if you can figure out the half-life of the substance, and then check your work. Welcome back. Let's see how you did. So at time zero, we have 100% of the particles being radioactive. To figure out the half-life here, what we're going to do is basically take the 100 and divide it in half. So we're going to go from 100 to 50. Once we get to 50, we're going to go across until we see where this intersects the line, and it intersects the line right here. So it's basically saying going from 100 to 50 takes about one year, but we wanna check ourselves. So let's take the 50 and cut it in half again. So 50 to 25, let's go to the 25 over and see where it intersects the line. And we can see again that has fallen right at the two. And then if we go from 25 to 12.5, we basically see that it intersects the line right here at three years. So if you said that the half-life of this sample was one year, you were correct. So what did you learn? We talked about radioactive decay, the basics. We talked about what is half-life. We learned how to use table N. We talked about mapping half-life. We talked about the graphical analysis of half-life data. And then we did some half-life practice problems at the end. Need more help? Feel free to contact me. Have a great day.